Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mort Zuckerman, and I'm uh, delighted to be able to uh, chair this particular panel. We were asked to cancel it by the candidates. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, refu we refused, actually, somebody said there was a great deal of interest in this, and we said the word is panic, not interest. So here we are um, dealing with uh, one of uh, perhaps the most serious financial crisis that uh, anybody here has had to witness in their lifetime, and fortunately we have an extraordinary panel to discuss this. Um, you all know who they are, but I'm going to just start by asking Professor Rubini the following question. How did we get to where we are today, and what does he think the implications are for the real economy, the Main Street economy, to get from the consequences of the crisis on Wall Street? Um, yes. Uh, certainly, I agree. This is the worst uh, financial crisis in the United States since the Great Depression. Of course, the degree of economic contraction is not going to be as severe as the Great Depression, but I think that from a financial point of view, we've not seen anything like this. I mean, how did we get to it? Uh, I think the simple answer might be this was the biggest asset and credit bubble in the U.S. history. It was fed by one easy money, the Fed cutting the Fed funds rate and keeping it too little, too low, uh, too low for too long. Uh, easy credit, a situation in which there was a no proper supervision regulation, not just of mortgages, but all sorts of financial intermediation. And we got a cycle with a, with a massive bubble. And of course, when the bubble goes bust with the housing crash and the subprime, you have the process of deleveraging after the period of releveraging. Why this time around is going to be, has been much more virulent. We've had these credit cycles in the US before, in other countries. I think it's been more virulent for the following reason. One is, a huge amount of financial innovation that created a financial system that is much more kind of opaque and non-transparent. You know, when you take a mortgage and through securitization you convert it to an MBS and then the MBS and a CDO and then a CDO and a CDO of a CDO of a CDO. You have at the end a CDO cube that is a new instrument that is new, exotic, complex, illiquid, marked to model, misrated by rating agencies, and you create a situation of generalized uncertainty, you know. Uh, agents can price risk when you have distribution over the van, so you can see what the distribution is. If you have generalized uncertainty, then there is panic, uh, there is a run, uh, there is risk aversion, everybody wants liquid assets. It's like walking on a kind of minefield blindfold, you don't know when the next mine is, you don't know how much toxic waste is out there, and you don't know who's holding it, and therefore you have a massive amount of panic and counterpart risk. You don't trust anybody. Today, the intermarket, interbank market is totally frozen because we've created a monster of this sort when there is no transparency in the financial system. The other reason why this is uh, kind of much worse is the point I made in the column I wrote for the Financial Times on, on Monday. Because of the greater regulation of the banking system, most of the financial intermediation in the last 20 years occurred in the shadow banking system. So you got uh, you know, the non-bank mortgage lenders, the sieves and the conduits, the broker dealers, the hedge funds, the private equity, the money market funds. Now, the trouble is that they look like banks. They like banks mostly borrow short. They are highly leveraged, more than banks. They lend long and in liquid ways. But they like banks that have access to, one, deposit insurance, and two, the lender last resort support of the Fed. These shadow banks did not have access, at least until recently, to those safety nets that, uh, that are essentially what prevent a self-fulfilling run on a solvent but illiquid bank. So what we have observed for the last uh, few months has been literally the demise and unraveling the collapse of the shadow banking system. It started with the collapse of these 300 plus non-bank mortgage lenders when their financing disappeared. Then there was the collapse of the sieves and the conduits when the asset-backed commercial paper behind them unraveled when they realized that they were investing into toxic stuff. Then you had essentially the run on all the broker dealers. Six months ago I said that there's not going to be any independent major broker dealer left in the next two years. It didn't take uh, two years, it took literally six months for all of them to disappear, one after the other. Two of them collapsed, one of them merged with Bank of America, the other two essentially decided to be converted into banks and be regulated like banks. Then the next round of it was, of course, the collapse of Fannie and Freddie, and now we've had the run on the money market funds. They were also investing some of the toxic stuff that was supposed to be safe. Now we have extended deposit insurance 
even to them. And I would say the next neg is going to be private equity and hedge funds. So literally, we have the entire collapse of the shadow banking system, most of this being folded in the traditional one. And at the end of the day, we'll have to be regulated like banks. There is no substantial difference between Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, and hedge fund. They're all like hedge funds. They borrow short, they're highly leveraged, they lend long. And institution of a certain size should be regulated all the same way, because this regulatory arbitrage has been the disaster that led us to the creation of the shadow banking system, not regulated at all or lightly regulated, and to this collapse of the system right now. So we're going towards a completely different financial system. Now, the collateral damage to a real economy is going to be massive. Even if this package is going to be done right, and we're going to discuss it a bit later on, I think the recession train has left the station. The recession started in the Q1 of this year. It's going to continue at least in the middle of next year. The banking and financial crisis uh, train has left the station as well. We are in a recession. We are in a financial and banking crisis. And we're going to do everything right. And there's a big if. So even if the Treasury plan is implemented properly, at this point, the difference is between a severe, nasty, U-shaped recession is going to last two years. Severe financial banking crisis is going to last two years. And instead, if we don't do it right, ending up like Japan in the 90s, when after the bursting of the real estate and equity bubble, that the L-shaped recession that lasted something like 10 years. So at this point, it's going to be severe regardless of the only thing we can do is try to minimize and make it less severe than otherwise. But the, real, the interaction, the perverse interaction between now the financial shocks hitting the real economy, the real economy contracting, leading to greater credit losses, leading to greater losses of profits. It's going to be a vicious circle. It's going to be very hard to stop in the short run. <laughs> somebody, somebody, when we were just uh, meeting before, uh, described Professor Rubini as an optimist or a pessimist. <laughs> But I will share with you the difference today. An optimist thinks this is the best of all possible worlds, and a pessimist fears he may be right. <laughs> now, <laughs> you can think about it, folks. You'll get it in a while. Uh, well, the real issue is, will we get this solution right? So why don't I uh, start with you and ask you what you think of the Treasury plan and its process through the system, and <coughs> whether you think <coughs> it'll work, and what its shortcomings are, and where it ought to be strengthened. I'm going to ask both of you to comment on that. Um, for the first uh, central point to make here is that um, we've already had some significant interventions in the market. Uh, I, I think a lot of people have already forgotten that we nationalized Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and that had a significant uh, effect on the marketplace. Mortgage rates came way down as soon as that was uh, announced. And since Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac currently account for, for about 75% of all uh, new mortgages uh, originated, that's bound to have a significant supportive effect for the market. I am concerned about the, the long-term effects of having these uh, two institutions under, under government control. But for the time being, that's a significant step forward. Uh, with regard to the, the uh, Paulson Bernanke plan, I, I don't really think too highly of it. Um, I think uh, any effective plan has, first of all, to distinguish between institutions that um, uh, are facing a liquidity problem on the one hand, and I think we can, we can deal with that through a rather narrow, targeted program, and other institutions that are effectively solvent or insolvent or are likely to become insolvent. I'm thinking in particular of AIG, and I think we handled that very well. Uh, we loaned them an enormous amount of money, but at a penal rate, and we took 80% of the company, and that's exactly the right way to deal with it. So when we're faced with uh, 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 companies that are likely to be insolvent, they should either be liquidated, or they should be nationalized partially or um, in toto. And the Paulson Bernanke plan does nothing to distinguish between institutions that are facing liquidity problem and those that are effectively uh, insolvent. Um, it exposes the taxpayer to uh, utterly enormous potential losses. Uh, they're not limiting, planning to limit their purchase of uh, assets to, for example, mortgages, at least things that can be reasonably uh, valued. They're planning um, to, to buy all sorts of toxic products, uh, many of which cannot be reasonably valued and probably won't be worth uh, very much uh, uh, ever. Um, uh, Bernanke has uh, emphasized the fact that this is, an, uh, this is an auction. It's a form of market mechanism. But there won't be any uh, market competition among buyers. The government will be the only buyer. 
Uh, so I did myself propose a form of resolution trust corporation to address liquidity problems back in December in the financial time, but it was a, a much more uh, a targeted program. It would have been focused on mortgages. The government would have um, uh, offered to buy up mortgages at very deep discounts, much deeper than Bernanke um, uh, is envisioning. And it would have involved, uh, A, the private sector being invited to bid more than the government, knowing that the government would only provide a very deep floor. Um, and second, I think the government would have wound up buying almost nothing under my plan, because many of the institutions who are facing problems now are facing problems because their counterparties don't trust their valuations of their assets. In other words, they're so, supposed to be marking their assets to market but their counterparties don't trust those valuations. If they could go to the government and say, give us a floor, they could mark the valuations of those assets credibly to the government floor price, then turn around to the market and say, well, now do you believe me? Even at these prices, I'm solvent. And that could kickstart the interbank credit market again without the government actually having to, to take on uh, these responsibilities for the assets. You want to... Uh... Sure. I mean, I guess I'm in the unusual position of being the comparative optimist. Um, I think that up until now, the government has managed this crisis as a series of liquidity crises. And if you look at how the government has responded, it's been through an enormous adjustment in the assets that the Fed holds on its balance sheet and has taken in ballpark 500 billion of less high quality assets and sold off 500 billion ballpark of treasuries. So that's managing it by providing liquidity to a financial system that was uh, fundamentally illiquid for the reasons Nouriel described. You know, if I wanted to synthesize Nouriel's uh, argument for why we're into trouble, I would say we're in trouble because we had institutions levered 30 to 1, lending to households levered 20 to 1, uh, which left no resilience on either side of the balance sheet. And it has been managed up to now as a sort of a, a liquidity event and through a series of ad hoc interventions and in individual institutions as they got into trouble. And I think that process had gone as far as it could have gone. And what I find uh, positive about the Paulson plan and Bernanke plan is that it's a recognition that the entire system has more bad assets than the system can sustain and support. And that the system cannot, uh, if everybody has the same basic bad bet ballpark, <laughs> it's very hard for that bad bet to be transferred to another institution because everybody is trying to get rid of the same bad bet at the same time. So you need another actor to come in. And unfortunately, I do think that actor has to be the government. My concerns with the Paulson plan are about the technicalities, about the price, what price you buy the bad assets off the banks, and what you get in return. Do you get any equity? Would you describe your concerns in terms of the price? Because Bernanke has said several things. Uh, uh, if these institutions sell these assets, or and particularly the paper, uh, he said it would be a have to be at fire sale prices. And then he says we would buy it on some kind of economic valuation that would, in a sense, see the, these uh, uh, the, uh, securities through to maturity. Now, uh, nobody, it seems to me, really can understand these securities well enough to figure that out. Why do we think some kind of public agency can do it? And if so, if they're going to be, in effect, buying it at a price well above the market price, the current market price, isn't that a huge subsidy to these institutions? On the other hand, if they buy them at the market price, these institutions will have to take such significant write-offs that they may literally be insolvent, at least for purposes of thinking about lending again. So could you comment on how you think this kind of purchase price can be determined, or if it can be term determined, other than by the market? Well, I think you perfectly described the, the, the dilemma. Uh, that is precisely it. If you pay a, a high price, you're recapitalizing the banking system by overpaying for bad assets. Um, and that's an, effectively a hidden equity infusion into the banking system, which deals with some of these concerns, but it's a huge assumption of risk by the taxpayers. If you pay a price that's even somewhat above a fire sale price, uh, you probably will reveal the insolvency of a couple of institutions, and that creates another problem that has to be addressed. So you have to choose which of those two you want to do, and I think that's a very hard choice to make. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think, I think you can't really value it. I think you just have to take a guess. I mean, if the market can't value it, the government can't value it. We just have to recognize we're, 
it's fundamentally impossible to value assets with so much uncertainty about the future trajectory of the economy and the future trajectory of housing prices. You're taking a gamble. I think it's also important to point out, although we're calling this uh, uh, an auction, and the lowest bidder gets to sell his assets to the government, these are not homogeneous uh, assets here. Uh, I don't know how you're reasonably going to take um, this huge pool of very diverse toxic assets and put them into clear groups and then have an auction for the group. Um, it, it's almost certain to wind up with the government vastly overpaying for this stuff. I, I don't really like the auction plan, but if there's going to be an auction, at the very least, it should include private sector bidders, not just the government committing to, to buy up uh, what, what uh, institutions are willing to sell to them. Noriel, do you want to come in here? Yes, I mean, I think there's this fundamental valuation question that we could discuss for, you know, hours whether they should be bought at, uh, you know, market value or something closer to hold the maturity. I think that the only way to resolve it is going to be then that the government will have to have some upside if it's going to buy these assets. So I think you resolve that incentive problem by having the government taking some preferred shares in exchange for buying the assets. And therefore, if they're going to overpay, then there's going to be a benefit in terms of the value of that equity participation. I think that's one of the goals to resolve this question. I'm surprised they didn't specifically propose something like that, given that's precisely what we did in the case of AIG. I think that was handled very well, was handled very quickly. Okay, so that this was a decision that had to be made on the fly, but it was made very responsibly and I think very effectively. And I think it's, it's, it's very likely that the taxpayer will, will come out very well on that deal. Let me go to something that was implicit in one of the things you said, which was uh, the fact that mortgage rates went down when Fannie and Freddie, in effect, were more or less nationalized. Let me go to the other side of it. Um, the, the, the word credit comes from the Latin word credere, to believe. I think all of the lenders have stopped believing in each other and, frankly, even in their own financial conditions. So let me just give you an idea of what's happening with mortgage lenders on the residential side. They're insisting on much higher credit verification on the part of the borrower. They're going to be much lower loan-to-value ratios. The appraisals, the interest rates are going to at least be higher, I think, unless they are going to be completely bought out by Fannie and Freddie in one form or another. But the, also the appraisals on the basis of which they're going to make loans are going to be much more conservative than they had before. So I still do not see how, particularly when the appraisers are going to be looking forward and seeing further declines in the value of homes, I don't see how this is going to really stimulate the housing world, uh, even though it sounds good on paper. Nouriel, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I mean, in my view, actually, the trouble in the U.S. economy is that we have, for the last 20 years, subsidized the most unproductive form of capital accumulation, this housing capital that gives you some, you know, utility services, but it's not productive in terms of increasing the productivity of labor. We've not invested enough in machinery and other stuff and more in the housing stock. And I think that trying artificially to prop up the housing market, it doesn't make sense. You know, there's still a huge excess inventory of homes. You could stop producing new homes today for almost a year and to get rid of that excess inventory. The price adjustment has to continue, and I think that we at some point realized that probably continuing subsidizing and cropping is not going to be the right solution. There has to be a price adjustment. The inventory has to be worked out. This housing recession is going to continue for a while. Home prices have fallen from the peak already 25%. My own work suggests they're going to fall another 15%, 40%, just to bring it back to what the real home prices were before this bubble started. So we had a huge bubble, and we should not do things essentially artificially try to prevent that market process from occurring. And I think that over time, actually, if we have less homes and less investment in housing and more investment in productive capital, that's going to be good for the U.S. economy. I, I don't think it's a bad thing for the economy more to people have to put down 10 or 20 percent when they go to buy a house. I don't think it's a bad thing if houses are appraised and if people's uh, incomes and credits are checked. I think that's something we should have done a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I also think we've made uh, too much of um, uh, perhaps a fetish out of um, a home ownership of, over the years, the notion that somehow to rent is a terrible, terrible thing and that really we should get everybody into his or her uh, own home, even if that involves massive personal risk for that uh, person. And not only that, as we've learned, socialization of utterly uh, enormous risk for all of us. 
Now, let me, let me though, uh, go to another point, which is what's happening to home prices. Uh, uh, there are an estimated 10 million homes where the mortgages exceed the value of the homes. If you have another 15% drop in prices, that number may go up to between 15 and 20 million homes. Now, some of those homes, a much larger proportion of those homes than we have ever imagined, are going to be foreclosed and thrown on the market. That will change the supply and demand by, in effect, uh, accelerating or, or supercharging the decline. Um, how, do you foresee anything like that happening? And what would be the significance if you didn't have the 15%, which might be a normal decline in relation to where house prices have really uh, sort of grown by 3% a year from 1945 to the year 2000? I think they grew by 16% a year between 2002 and 2006. If it gets back to some more normal level, but it may also be distorted by now not artificially attractive financing, but an artificial supply to the market from foreclosed homes where lenders, particularly if they're, these mortgages have been securitized, are just going to want to get rid of them as quickly as possible. What do you think will happen then? Well, I think you pointed out right, uh, rightly the most crucial thing. With home falling about 30, 35 percent, about 40 percent of households that have a mortgage, or about 21 out of the 51, the mortgage are going to be underwater. <sighs> with negative equity in their homes, essentially with the value of their homes below the value of the mortgages. And as you know, in the United States, mortgages are effectively non-recourse loans. <clears throat> so if you decide to walk away from your home for underwater, what people refer to as jingle mail, and you put the keys in an envelope, you send it to the bankers, and you say goodbye, then the creditor cannot go after you for the difference between the value of the home and the value of the mortgage. By the way, there are entire websites like uh, walkaway.com we're teaching you how to walk away from your home and minimizing the legal risk because this is becoming a big issue. And it's actually it's a bigger issue not just for subprime because, you know, if you're a subprime borrower, eventually you might be kicked out because, you know, you cannot pay and you're going to foreclose and evict you. But actually think about all the people who are essentially buying second home, vacation homes, the condo flippers, the speculative homes. We're putting zero down, so we started with no, no equity. Now they're deeply into negative equity. Why would they want to service it? So it's old A's, the prime, the jump all the other stuff. And I've made some estimate that in, on top of the three, four hundred billion dollars of write-downs from subprime, this walk-away phenomenon is going to give you at least, even the best of circumstances, suppose that only one out of, out of five people that are underwater, only 20% of them are going to walk away. You get another additional $400 billion losses for the financial system. If the number is 50%, meaning half of the people underwater eventually walk away, you get the number of a trillion dollar. In that case, you wipe out most of the capital of the U.S. banking system. But even in the most kind of conservative assumption of one out of five, <laughs> you get another $400 trillion, billion dollars of losses on top of the $400, $400 billion already written down. So the effects on the financial system of this particular thing are going to be actually disastrous. Boy, I thought this was going to be serious. Uh, <laughs> but let me, let me go to other dimensions of it. Uh, we are talking about a huge expenditure in one form or another on the part of the Treasury and the part of the federal government. It's going to take the deficit, which is presently running at around $500 billion, into some stratospheric level, maybe well over a trillion dollars. What is that going to do to the dollar? What's that going to do to interest rates? What's that going to do to the uh, support of... Um, uh, the, or the willingness of other countries to continue to hold the dollar? And what is it going to do the heating system here in the Council on Foreign Relations? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, it, it's, it's a serious potential risk. Um, I, I think that the, the most essential thing that we have to do is preserve the integrity of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. Um, I, I, I'm at least pleased that what we're talking about now will be done, as it were, on the Treasury's balance sheet. Um, that uh, at least in the short term, there's uh, not an imminent risk of, of, of printing money uh, to, to finance it. Um, having said that, um, the, the temptation over time to inflate our way out of, out of this debt that we're building up is enormous. And we, we must reckon with the fact that we're very dependent on uh, foreign capital inflows uh, into the United States and um, uh, foreigners are going to be very, very concerned about the obligations that we're taking on. Um, in terms of you know, the potential downside risk, it's important to understand that the current valuation of the dollar 
is um, uh, founded in a world in which about two-thirds of global trade is, is denominated in dollars, about two-thirds of global foreign exchange reserves are denominated in dollars. If we move towards a very different world where um, people outside the United States do not con uh, need to or wish to continue to, to trade and save in dollars, that means that the dollar has a long way further down to go. So we need to be very, very careful about containing uh, the, not just the size of this crisis, but the size of the uh, intervention. If I could jump in really yeah. quick. I and mean, I think the deficit per se is unlikely to get that much bigger than a trillion dollars. Uh, it will get bigger because of counter cyclical fiscal policies. But in addition to the sort of fiscal deficit, the US government is effectively becoming a financial intermediary. We're selling $200 billion of treasuries to buy $200 billion of agencies to keep credit flowing to the housing sector. That's effectively the US government acting as a bank. The US government's going to buy up $700 billion if Paulson's plan is passed of bad assets off the banking system, which means there'll be another increase of $700 billion of treasuries into the market. The net effect is that there will certainly be well over a trillion dollars in treasury bonds that are issued over the next four quarters. I think that's unambiguously the case. And there's a race between whether the Treasury is issuing more bonds than investors want to buy at a point in time when investors are flocking into the Treasury market. And if you look at what is happening in the Treasury market, yields are going down, not going up, because for now the panic in the market is stronger than the increase in supply. I'm not convinced that that will continue. In some sense, I would hope it doesn't continue and that there's a little bit of upward pressure on Treasury interest rates, because that would signal that there's been some return of confidence into the financial sector. But I think it's a very tough uh, balance. And the other small point I would make is that if central banks act as central banks have acted in the past, and our creditors continue to peg their currencies to the dollar, there's a very consistent pattern, which is the worse the dollar does, the more foreign central banks buy, which provides an element of stability but it's also perpetuated very large deficits for a very long time. If that continues, I think we can avoid the worst. Well, let me uh, just sort of talk about what the possibilities are now going forward. Uh, you have a situation in which we may have, let's say, somewhere between a trillion and a trillion and a half dollars in a federal deficit looking forward. You have a major drop in the value of homes, which is bound to affect consumer spending. You have a major change in the confidence of lenders both into the housing market and frankly into the business market, uh, which in part is, uh, as you describe, what's happening to the flow of funds. People are not uh, translating the money into the sectors that lend it, but just into treasuries and government-backed securities. And uh, you're going to have lenders in the business world, uh, the banks in particular, being much more conservative about their lending practices. So this seems to me, when you have the drop in consumer confidence, the drop in housing values, the drop in the ability of the credit system to advance credit, um, given where we are starting from, that we may have a very serious recession next year. Is that a view that uh, any of you share? And if so, what are the tools available to the federal government to turn this around? Yeah, my view is that we are already in a recession. I mean, if you look at the data, Carefully, the recession started in Q1, and if you look at the latest data for consumption, you know the the, the, the scary stuff about the tax rebate was it was supposed to stimulate consumption into August and September, right? 100 billion dollar, two thirds of it being spent. Instead, you look at the data: April and May, real spending, real retail sales go up, and then starting in June, June, July, and August, real retail spending and real personal spending is the proxy that BA uses for consumption have been falling. So in the Q3 number, we we'll already see consumption dropping for the first time since 1991. It did not happen in 2001. So we are in a consumer recession right now. And with consumption being 70% of GDP, then we're going to see already in the Q3 number negative GDP growth. So the debate at this point is not anymore on whether consumption is going to fall, but rather how much and for how long. And given the headwinds on consumption, my view of it is going to continue this drop into at least the middle of next year. Think of it, you have a U.S. consumer, this one, shopped out, saving less debt burden. The debt to disposable income of the household sector has gone from 108 years ago percent to 140 today. And now this U.S. consumer is buffeted by a series of headwinds. 
you have the fall of your home prices, so you cannot use your home as ATM machine. You have home equity withdrawal collapsing to zero from $700 billion three years ago. You have the fall in the equity markets by 20% negative wealth effect. You have a credit crunch is going from subprime to near prime to prime to credit cards to auto loans to the loans. If you look at the Q2 flow of funds data, there is already a contraction of credit. The price of credit is going up. You have not only debt ratios that are high, but debt servicing ratios for the houses going higher because of resets of mortgages, credit cards, auto loans, student loans. You have the increase in oil and food prices squeezing real purchasing power. You have consumer confidence down to the level of the 70s stagflation. And all these headwinds, people say, are there, but, but as long as there is job generation, people are going to keep on consuming because there's going to be income generation. But guess what? For nine months in a row today, we've had a fall in private employment. For eight months in a row, we've had a fall in employment, including public employment. And every indicator of the labor market, like initial claims suggest, is worse to happen. We're going to have an unemployment rate above 8% at the bottom of this thing. So essentially, the consumer right now is faltering. And the tax rebate was supposed to boost consumption into August, September, was gone by May. Why? Because people are so burdened with debt that the tax rebate they've been saving it, they've been using to pay their credit card, their mortgages. At this point, it's going to have a nasty consumer recession. There's not going to be much to avoid it. Uh, would either of you care to uh, add to? Uh, well, I mean, we are using that? all policy tools available. We've cut interest rates down to 2%. Conceivably, they could go lower. We've increased the fiscal deficit. We could conceivably increase the fiscal deficit more. We've had the government uh, agencies dramatically increase their lending to households to offset a contraction in the private mortgage-backed securities market. We could have that continue. You can take all these steps you, and uh, turbocharge them, but that has a cost. The other angle is that the rest of the world could adopt policies to support their economies, uh, which would help support the one bright engine or a bright spot in the American economy, which has been exports. So if the rest of the world adopts policies directed at stimulating their domestic economies and their domestic demand, rather than supporting their exports, that would tend to help support economic activity here. Do you want to add anything to this? Uh... Oh, I, I agree with uh, Nouriel that we're, we're probably already um, uh, in, re in recession. If, if not, it, it's, it's imminent. The question is how deep it's going to go. Um, in terms of the traditional tools we use to uh, address recessionary forces, monetary, fiscal policy, I think we're probably in agreement that we've gone as far as we can go in terms of uh, fiscal policy. Uh, we, I, I don't know if we're in agreement on monetary policy. I think we went to, uh, way too far. Um, I think we've built up um, inflation expectations to uh, a level um, at which we're going to have tremendous difficulty beating them back down again, and that means higher real interest rates in the future. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, two additional points. You know, six months ago, we could have hoped that the rest of the world, by growing fast, could rescue us from the recession or have one that was more short and more shallow. The trouble is when you look at the second quarter number right now, 55% of global GDP, practically all of the advanced economies are contracting. The Eurozone is contracting, UK is contracting, Canada is contracting, Japan is contracting, New Zealand is contracting. So the idea that the rest of the world is going to essentially through it, it seems because they were our exports, get us out of the problem, is not there anymore because of a series of financial shocks housing bust in other parts of the world, tight monitoring credit conditions have led to essentially most of the advanced economies to tip over into a recession. Right now, this is a Eurozone recession, the G7 recession is an advanced economy recession. The only question mark right now is whether even the emerging market economy is going to slow down so sharply as it may occur that we're going to end up into something like a global recession. That's one risk right now. In terms of the policy tool, Monetary policy has not been effective. It's like pushing on a string. Interbank spreads are as wide as ever because of counterparty risk. This is a solvency problem. It's not a illiquidity problem. Traditional fiscal policy has not made any difference because, again, people are saving it. I think the critical thing about the, the, kind of policy, uh, the, the program of the government is that in addition to buying the bad assets, you have to work them down. The household sector is a debt problem. It's insolvent. So 
When Argentina, Russia, and Ecuador were insolvent, you default, you reduce the face value of the debt, you start growing again. When a corporation is distressed, too much debt, you go in Chapter 11, you reduce the face value of the debt, you start growing again. When the household sector is too much debt, there is a debt overhead, and they cannot spend, there is no discretionary income. So you need across the board debt reduction. If debt doesn't occur, if that's not part of the plan, you're not going to resolve anything. So a plan that just buys the assets and park them somewhere is not going to make a difference. You need something more than an RTC. You need what was done during the Great Depression. During the Great Depression, the homeowners loan corporation, the OCLC, was created. It bought all the mortgages from the banks, reduced the face value, converted people into fixed rate longer term mortgages, and allowed them to stay in their homes. You avoided the tsunami of foreclosure, because if you're going to have a tsunami of foreclosure, the borrowers lose their homes, the, the lenders go bust, and then the fiscal cost of bailing out the banks through deposit insurance is going to be massive. So you need the macro equivalent of a Chapter 11, in which you avoid the liquidation of the entire banking system or liquidation of the household sector. And that's not part of the plan. And unless that part of the plan, that reduction is going to be central to it, we're not going to resolve the fundamental problem of why we're in a recession. Well, um, I'm going to uh, turn this session open now for the Q&A part of our meeting. Uh, I'd like to invite members to join our conversation with their questions. Please wait for the microphone and speak directly into it. Please stand, state your name and affiliation, and limit yourself to one question and certainly not even one speech. Keep it as concise as possible so that as many members as possible could ask their questions. First question over here. Thank you. I'm Tony Holmes from the Council here. Thank you for the very vivid and graphic picture you've painted. Could you please overlay on top of that picture and give us a sense of timing, both in terms of the timing of the impact on the real economy, as well as place a second overlay with some sort of outline of the U.S. presidential campaign and the implications of all this in the aftermath of the election on the choices and flexibility of the new administration. Who would you like? Would you, anybody care to uh, try that? Would you like to try and answer? Mm -hmm. Do you want to try and answer? Well, want you try and answer? Of course, um, Look, I, I think um, uh, both candidates are going to find themselves severely constrained. Um, there will be some sort of big intervention plan. And we know that whatever that's uh, going to be, it's going to be uh, exceptionally expensive. So there's going to be little opportunity for uh, either uh, a candidate as president to introduce his, his own plan on top of that. So a, another sort of fiscal intervention, I think, is, is really um, uh, impossible, really absolutely impossible. I think the best thing that the next administration can do is start building the, the groundwork for a more effective regulatory system. And that's much easier said than done because we've had lots of well-intentioned ideas in the past, extremely well-intentioned ones, that have turned out rather badly. Let me give you just one example. Um, imposing uh, a tiered capital standards on banks in the late 1980s and early 1990s was intended to ensure that we wouldn't have problems like the SNL uh, crisis, that banks would be well capitalized. But what it encouraged financial institutions to do was to get these assets off their books, to securitize them and pass them on to someone else. So if you ask how did we get where we are now, certainly, certainly at least part of it was the effect of very well-intentioned interventions in the past. So building a sound regulatory framework to make sure that we don't get into this problem in the future is, is going to be a major challenge. I, I would say as well that we're, we're likely to begin having a, a real debate again for the first time in, the, in a long time about what good monetary policy is. Um, 
there had uh, been a, a, an impression that because consumer price index inflation did not soar in the early part of this decade, that we were okay, we didn't have to worry about soaring asset prices. But I would point out that in the 1990s, we saw the same sort of thing in Asia and Latin America before their crises. In the run-up to the crises, asset prices boomed and consumer price index inflation remained very, very low. When the crises hit, when the currency crises hit, inflation soared. We're experiencing the same sort of thing now. Um, so I think we're going to start having a debate again about what proper monetary uh, policy is, that perhaps uh, inflation targeting is not the be-all and end-all, that we have to uh, uh, pay attention to asset prices, not because government officials are so smart and know what asset prices should be, but when people start moving en masse into certain assets, for example, like gold, what they're saying is, we want alternative monetary assets. We don't trust the monetary asset that the government is producing, and central banks need to take account of that. Question over there. Hi, my name is Michael Prawley. I'm with uh, JER Partners. And I have, we have a lot of real estate investments in emerging markets, so my question is for Professor Rubini. I mean, up until at least the last few days, a lot of the economists and analysts were saying that, you know, the emerging markets would not be as impacted. In fact, they could actually help avoid a global recession because emerging markets account for maybe 40 percent of global GDP on a purchasing power parity basis. And my question is, do you think that emerging markets, because of their domestic liquidity, will remain largely isolated from the uh, European and U.S. financial crisis, or will they be significantly adversely impacted? Well, I, I expect a pretty significant adverse uh, impact, you know, because of trade links, because of financial links, between of currency links, between of confidence links. You know, the global economy for the last few years has been one in which the U.S. was the consumer of first and last resort, spending more than its income, running current account deficits like China, Asia, and other emerging markets where the producer of first and last resort spending less than their income running current account surpluses. So what you have to ask yourself, suppose there is a sharp fall in U.S. private consumption demand. Is there enough domestic private demand in the rest of the world in emerging market that can grow to sustain global economic growth? And my answer is no, because, you know, in U.S. Uh, total consumption is about $9.5 trillion. Take the entire consumption of a billion Chinese, is about a trillion dollar. Take all of the consumption of almost a billion Indians, is $600 billion. So the sum of the consumption of two billion Chindians is about one-sixth of the U.S. consumption, right? So if there is a sharp fall in U.S. consumption, can their consumption go up by 500 percent in order to compensate for the fall in the U.S.? The answer is no. The question in these countries that are relying, especially uh, China, some parts of Asia, some parts of Latin America, on export to the United States as the main engine of growth, and the rest of their demand is essentially production of investment goods that produce more exportables, is the question of whether their policy stimulus in terms of monetary and fiscal policy can be aggressive enough to avoid a hard landing. And for China, by the way, our landing means a growth rate going from 11 to 6 percent because China needs a growth rate of 10 percent in order to move about 15 million poor rural farmers to the modern industrial sector every year and maintain social and political stability. And my concern is that while now they're going to have a fiscal stimulus, they cannot so aggressively front load all of the infrastructure spending wanted to do over the next five, ten years, over a year or two. And if that's the case, actually, their policy response may not be aggressive enough to control the fallout coming from the collapse of demand in the United States and the recession in the rest of the advanced economy. And if, if China goes into a, essentially a hard landing, then the two main engines of global growth, that were U.S. and China, one on the consumption, the other one on the production, are going to have a recession or a near recession, then you have real trouble for the global economy. I could just make one small amendment to what Nouriel said, which is that over the last two years, Europe has been a bigger engine of demand growth for most of them, the emerging world and the United States, because our net exports have been uh, we've contributing to growth. And so for much of the emerging world, the economic trajectory of Europe over the next 12 months will matter as much, if not more, than that of the United States, which is a significant change from the world of, say, five years ago. In terms of the so-called, very briefly, in terms of so-called BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India and China, I'm particularly concerned about Brazil and Russia. 
for the reason that we really haven't seen fundamental reforms in those economies. Their boom has been very much based on the rise in commodities prices. If global demand really does take a, a, a deep hit, I think Brazil and uh, Russia go down with it. And commodity prices have already fallen about 20% from their peak in July, given that people are now pricing in a global economic slowdown in U.S. recession. So that's already negatively affecting, among other reasons, both Brazil and Russia. Rick, do you have a question? Uh, my name is Rick Solomon, East End Advisors. Um, let me make one comment and ask one question. Uh, ben, comment about inflation expectations. Yesterday, for the first time that I can remember, the real yield on tips was exactly the same as the yield on treasuries, which would suggest that inflation expectations in the market are almost non-existent over the, the term of those treasuries, which is either five years or ten years. I think the, the expectations today are much more in line with what Mort was saying, these highly contractionary forces, which we have to weather first. I mean, inflation may be a Chapter 2 problem, but it's certainly not the Chapter 1 problem that people are worried about. That's just a comment. Question for, for Professor Rubini. Um, in your sequence of troubled institutions, you listed investment banks, and then you mentioned hedge funds and private equity firms. I'm interested in that sequencing. In the case of investment banks, you have institutions which were leveraged 30 to 40 to 1 that financed their business very short term, daily, weekly, monthly. In the case of hedge funds, and private equity is even more extreme, but in the case of hedge funds, you have, for the most part, institutions which are levered 2 to 1 that have long-term locked up capital. So I don't see how the sequencing plays out the way you describe. Yeah. On your question, actually, before your question, I agree that inflation in the short term is not going to be an issue. Slack in goods markets, slack in labor markets, slack in commodity markets is going to imply that at least in the short run, inflation is going to be the least problem that the Fed and other advanced economies in the bank will have to face. For your question about the role of for private equity and a hedge fund, uh, hedge funds have a lock up period of about a year, and then within a month or a quarter, you can have redemption, and there will be already massive redemption. Hedge funds, some of them leverage a lot, and most of their financing, like for the broker dealers, is overnight repo. And now with the squeeze of the prime brokers, there's a risk that those that are hedge funds that are weaker, high leverage, poor performing, are going to have essentially their credit line cut off. So you're not going to have the same run that you can get on a bank or a money market fund or a sieve or a broker dealers. But even in the case of hedge funds, you're going to have over time roll-offs of credit and of redemptions. For private equity, among the shadow members of the banking system, is the only one who has a longer term financing. In some sense, the problems are even bigger because the typical LBO a few years ago had a debt to earnings ratio of three to four. The last batch of a trillion plus had a debt to equity ratio of something like 10 or 15 or even more. It was crazy. LBOs, they should have never occurred. Now it's going to be a slow fuse run. Why? Because you have covenant light clauses, you have peak toggles and all sorts of things that imply that the refinancing crisis is going to occur maybe six months from now, a year from now. But with credit spreads that a year ago in June were 250 and now they're closer to 1,000, once that refinance has to occur, many of these LBOs that should have never occurred are going to go bust. So the private equity bubble is also going to go bust. It's going to be a slow motion run, not the same way you have on the other members of the shadow banking system, but things are going to happen as well. Uh, tre uh, to address Rick's point, Treasury prices have a very bad track record in terms of predicting uh, inflation, and that's for, for good reason because you have obviously countervailing effects. Um, um, uh, determining uh, whether people go into or, or out of treasury bonds. Last week, at, at one point at the height of the crisis, as you know, short-term treasury yields went down to a, a fraction of, of 1%, so that flight to safety effect makes it very difficult to measure. If you look at um, uh, asset prices that have historically um, had a, a, a good track record predicting inflation, you would look at gold prices, and I think you'd be concerned. Question back there, yes. Um, George de Menil of Paris School of Economics. Um, the, there's a criticism that's been made of the Paulson Bernanke rescue plan that uh, the focus on the balance sheet is misguided and that $700 billion would be better spent uh, by buying equity selectively and, and bringing capital to those institutions that are deemed to be solvent uh, and letting those that are not go. Would you comment on that? It's, uh, George Soros takes this position in the FT this morning. Uh, no, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that you need to do a combination of three things to resolve the financial crisis. 
One is an RTC type of thing. You take some of the assets off the balance sheet at a certain price. You reliquify part of the financial system after having done the triage, of course, between those who are insolvent and should be let go and those that are distressed, undercapitalized, that once you provide liquidity capital, they can't work. Uh, the second thing you do to do is the debt reduction. And third thing is, that, of course, once the bank takes the write down, they are undercapitalized, and therefore, if they have to get credit, they have to be recapitalized. How do you do it? I think you do it in three or four different ways. The first way you do it is essentially the government takes some preferred shares for its uh, injection of liquidity. The second thing you do, like the RFC during the Great Depression, where 4,000 banks got preferred shares from the government and they increased their capital. The third thing you do is that if the government is going to put preferred shares, then they see the other common shareholders would also inject capital and they should suspend that dividend payments. Otherwise, the government takes the first risk while they should be sharing into that. So inject capital through private capital. And the final thing you do is the thing that even the unsecured creditors of the banks, meaning the sub debt and the other ones leaving aside the insured deposit, should take a hit. You can do a debt for equity swap. So there are many different ways in which you can recapitalize the banks. And that's a necessary component of it because if you don't recapitalize the banks and take a hit, then you're going to have a massive credit contraction. So it's a combination of all the things. You need an RTC, you need the HOLC, you need an RFC, you need the triage. And if you do it right, combined together, we're going to eventually get out this thing. And the trouble with the treasury plan that originally was just a bad version of an RTC, didn't have all the other components of it. The Swedish rescue plan, yeah. Yeah. which we haven't discussed so far today, did in fact involve the yeah. government taking very significant equity stakes <coughs> in banks. Uh, thank you. I'm Jeffrey Rosen from Lazard. Um, what you suggest for fiscal policy and monetary policy, massive stimulus deficits, uh, low interest rates, uh, implies an inflationary risk in the future. What you describe for the um, asset market, the real estate market, the commercial real estate market perhaps, certainly the residential real estate market, suggests an asset deflation risk. And I'm just curious which of the two you think is more serious and whether you think there are implications for what's happening now for asset deflation in the future, which brings back to mind the Japanese type of scenarios. And if I'm allowed, and he'll take a minute, I'm just curious what Mort's views are on the impact of all this on the political season. I think both of them are serious. And the uh, RTC plan that I put forward with uh, Mark Fish in December was uh, meant to address pr precisely that problem. But the inflation risk is all also serious, and we know that we can experience the, the two uh, together uh, in some combination. And the 1970s was a, a particularly bad period. Um, I, I think in, in, many sen in, in many senses, the next five to 10 years are going to look like the 1970s. In other words, we're going to have at best very sluggish growth. We're going to have elevated real interest rates, elevated um, uh, inflation rates, elevated commodity prices. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a painful period that's going to involve both uh, asset depreciation uh, and uh, an element of higher inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, anybody else want to come uh, in, please? Yes, both of us. Um, I would put slightly more emphasis on the risk of asset deflation in large part because I think the, the process by which loose U.S. monetary policy was producing uh, super loose monetary policy in places like China and the Gulf that were pegging to the dollar and generating globally loose monetary policy, I think that process is about to go into reverse and that you'll see a much stronger contractionary uh, element from the global economy from the emerging world, which will take some of the inflationary pressure off. No. I don't know. I think like in the cycle of 2001, 2003, in a six months, we're going to start worrying about deflation, where certainly asset deflation, slacking goods, labor, and commodity market means inflation is going to be the least of the problems that the Fed has to worry. You're right about one point. If you're going to essentially monetize all the fiscal deficit, that's going to be eventually inflationary. But I think that the way it's going to be financed is going to be by public debt. It's going to increase interest rates, but it's not going to be monetized. Now, the liquidity injection in the short run are satisfying a demand for liquidity that you can take away once the demand for liquidity goes away. So that's not inflationary. And most of the, what the Fed does with the swap lines doesn't increase the money supply. It's just a swap of bad assets for good assets. So if we were to monetize this huge fiscal problem, absolutely will have a massive inflation problem down the line. But even a dovish 
Fed with Bernanke cannot afford essentially destroying the inflation kind of uh, expectation, rise them because if the inflation expectation comes out of the bottle, then to bring it back you're going to need a nasty Volcker disinflation and we have a severe recession. And even a dovish Fed cannot afford essentially to monetize this problem. Therefore, we're going to fiscalize it. We'll have to raise taxes, cut spending, us and the next generation. I think that's the way this crisis is going to be resolved, not through the inflation. Uh, I'll just uh, make a brief comment about the last uh, part of your question. Uh, I believe if the election had been held two weeks ago that McCain would have won. He was ahead in all the key battleground states as a quota. Um, it's amazing to me how close the election, the polls are to this moment. And since I don't believe that the polls accurately reflect where the votes are going to come out and that the votes will be much more than the polls indicated in McCain's favor. It's still a close election. I cannot imagine the, that the impact of this crisis, is, which is going to make the economy the dominant issue from now until the end, unless there was some enormous gaffe or differential uh, effect of the first debate. Um, uh, I just don't see how Obama loses. If he does, uh, it will really say something very, very serious about race relations. I have to say, because I think that's the only issue that would defeat him. If it were a, a, a generic poll, if it were any other Democrat, I think it would be a walk away. Uh, question of the mayor. Uh, thank you, Mahesh Um the, the question I have is with respect to the 700 uh, billion uh, package and whether the number is right, if you assume it's only directed at uh, what you prefer, perhaps uh, if I read it right, which is capitalization of the banking system. Uh, if, it was, if it was moving in that direction, what is, the, is, the, is that an adequate size? Uh, I would separate two things. One, you need to recapitalize the banks. That means additional public money and also private money and some debt for equity swap that transform some of the debt on the balance sheet of the banks into equity from the need to buy some of these assets and take them off the balance sheet of the financial system. I think the impaired assets are probably closer to a trillion and a half. With discount of uh, about you know 30 percent, you need about a trillion, not 700. If the discount is even smaller than that, eventually this plan is not going to be a 700 billion dollar plan. It's going to be more than that if the size of the problem is a 1.5 trillion of bad assets. But then you have to also make a political decision of how you allocate scarce uh, public capital. How much of it is going to go into truly recapitalizing the banks as opposed to buying off the bad assets? And you have to make the right trade-offs in that direction. But you're going to need even more money, most likely. Um, I'm sorry, uh, but we've come to the end of the hour. I'll just uh, make uh, two small comments, one personal and one uh, general. We now understand why economics is known as a dismal science <laughs> at one time. And the second one is, with, with all due respect, I hope you will all uh, allow me to use the word chinians first in my editorial, and then afterwards anybody else could do that. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. <laughs> That was terrific. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.